We got to, over time, we, we got to know each other, and I got to learn about cavity spot in carrots, uh, which is a um, pathogen that gets in and has a big impact on, on carrot quality. But Elaine also taught me a lot at that stage about how pathologists can work with other people, and in that case, those experiments were set up for plant physiology and for water use efficiency type experimentation, um, and Elaine was in there sampling and getting the best out of that for the industry that she was working in. And that's a really important message. I think we're going to hear more about that from her today, where she's been working really closely with the industry right through her entire career, having great impact. Wine Ford from 1997, when I became the head of what was the school of UNESCO and we created the Department of Environment and Ag, it was a great pleasure to actually see that Elaine was still involved with the R&D at that particular school at the time. And I ran into an ex-student today uh, who'd been working um, with that department I said, I'm going to a seminar this afternoon from Elaine Davidson. Oh, yeah, she was one of the best lecturers or really just to our teachers we had. I'm just coming back years and years ago. So that's just a really important memory to share. I'm going to hand over to Elaine, uh, who's going to start her presentation. And um, let's please welcome Elaine. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I'm not quite sure I remember it quite like that. <laughs> um, can you all hear me? Because I'm rather quietly spoken. Um, if you can't hear me, I'll notice you going to sleep at the back. <laughs> I, I should start off by saying I've been wanting to give this seminar for quite a long time, but it's never really been quite the right time. And about 18 months ago, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, so I thought I'd better get a move on. So, let's get started. Okay, now, Western Australia is the envy of all the other states in Australia because it's got a triple A credit rating. And one of the factors 
is not just the good financial management by politicians, it's also the quality of the state's infrastructure, including roads. And what have roads got to do with plant pathology? Well, in the 1960s, there were large patches of dying plants, understory and midstory plants, in native vegetation in the southwest. And if I can make this work, uh, probably not. Um, you can see in the top picture, um, you've got... Oh, okay. Thanks, Fatima. You've got dying banksias or dead banksias along here in more or less a line. Um, it was shown in 1965 that these dead understory and midstory plants were associated with soil infestation by an introduced pathogen, uh, a soil-borne pathogen, Phytophthora cinnamomi, which is now known as the dieback fungus. I know it's an oomycete, not a fungus, so please don't pick me up on that, but uh, it's the name, the dieback fungus, is now in current usage in the general public locally. Um, this was eventually called Phytophthora dieback. Now, the Forest Department, which was the lead agency at the time, were very keen to map the distribution of Phytophthora because many of these patches were many hectares in extent. And they were using understory and midstory species to do this mapping. They found that it took at least 18 months between the time a site became infested with Phytophthora until symptoms showed up in the understory. And although the forest department had control over its workers in the forest, it didn't have control over many of the other users of the Jarrah forest. And so the forest department carried out a very comprehensive education campaign to explain why they wanted to get far more control over access to different parts of the forest. And in 1975, the Forest Act was changed, which allowed them to impose quarantine, as you have down here. And I'm sure many of you will have seen these sorts of signs um, in rather, perhaps rather remote parts of the Jarrah Forest, um, because they're really quite historic now. And there is a barrier here preventing access, and here is a gravel road. This allowed a period of quarantine to show uh, the symptoms to show up on infestive uh, sites. And Phytophthora, like all soil-borne pathogens, is spread by the movement of soil, including gravel. So gravel is a basic raw material, and it's widely used in roading in Western Australia. And Main Roads Western Australia has a policy to only use dieback-free gravel for road construction and repair. And it uses, in total through the whole state, about 5.5 million cubic metres of gravel per annum. Um, there are other, road, other users of gravel as well, shires, mining companies. Um, there are, uh, there's DBCA that makes a lot of uh, gravel roads. Now, in the past, gravel was sourced from an area of native vegetation where there was no symptoms of Phytophthora dieback. And you could then say that this, the gravel was dieback-free. However, and then the way in which the gravel was sourced was that the native vegetation was removed hygienically without trying any infest, trying to, without, um, in a way that would minimize the infestation of the site, the gravel was extracted. But that's not now considered an appropriate um, method of obtaining dieback-free gravel because native vegetation has a value in its own right and the cost of offsets and such like has made it exceedingly expensive. You could go and look for gravel on other sites where there is no native vegetation but if you're dependent on symptoms of Phytophthora dieback being shown up by the death of native plants, how do you know 
whether the gravel from a paddock, for example, is infested or not, particularly as Phytophthora has a very wide host range that's been shown in glasshouse experiments or in field sampling. And uh, consequently, you don't know whether wheat plants, for example, are infested or not. They may not die, but they can still be infected. But being infected is not, of course, the same thing as the, the ability to kill a plant. So one of the examples of how uh, gravel is used, here we have um, an area in the, on the Albany Highway. Um, this is in Glen Eagle Forest. The edges of this road have been um, repaired to make them a bit stronger. And because it's in native vegetation, and this is being done by main roads, then they would be trying to use dieback-free gravel along uh, this road for, for um, uh, the repair of the road. Um, so dieback-free gravel, one that you know is free of Phytophthora, is in short supply. And I wondered about 20 years ago whether infested gravel can be treated to kill Phytophthora. This is where the link with Mark comes in. Um, the, the chemical in question was that I thought might be suitable is methamp sodium. It's used in horticulture. So it's registered for use in Australia. Um, it's tine injected into soil using a rig like this. It's classed as a fumigant, but it's actually methamp sodium is a liquid. And so it can be injected into soil um, to the depth of about 15 centimeters, which would be the rooting depth of uh, carrots and uh, potatoes and strawberries and so on. Um, and in soil, it breaks down to a gas, methyl isothiocyanate, MITC. And it's the MITC, which is the bioactive agent. It has a half-life of about three days. And being a gas, it's going to diffuse through the soil mainly up and, to some extent, laterally. So in order to try and uh, uh, extend its life in the soil, the soil has to be capped in some way to prevent it, the MITC escaping. And this can be done by using um, uh, polythene sheeting. In the case of the horticultural industry locally, the soil is rolled to compact it, and then it's irrigated heavily to make a water seal. Uh, MITC breaks down into oxides of carbon, nitrogen, and so sulfur, so it leaves no residues. Can methamsodium be used to treat gravel? If it is, it would have to be used very differently. And ideally, you would use it here at the stop top of a stacker, which is making these big gravel stockpiles. But methane sodium isn't registered for use in gravel. Use of chemicals in Australia is regulated by the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority, the APVMA, and you'll hear a bit more about them. And so in order to um, make this treatment legal, you would need the change in the label of the usage of methane sodium. But before you get to that, you really need to answer a few questions. Firstly, does it work? Because if it doesn't work, there's no point in pursuing this. And can it be used safely? Which is one of the great concerns of the APVMA. And finally, if it does work and it can be used safely and there is a label change, is it going to be cost effective? Because if it's not, there's no point in using it. So we started off with some money. Um, and the early work on efficacy was done in the, in the lab. Now, I'm not going to go in a blow-by-blow -blow account of all the things we did, but I just wanted to give you some idea of the sort of experiments that we're doing. We did a number of small experiments looking at the effects of methane sodium uh, of MITC on Phytophthora over time and at different <coughs> rates. So the sort of experiments that were done 
were using a small amount of gravel in a flask here. We had millet seed infested or colonized by Phytophthora, which was separated from the gravel. And then after the um, methane sodium was added to the gravel, not to the millet seed, uh, then we would take the millet seed out and plate it onto agar, which is selective for Phytophthora. And so here we've got different concentrations of methane sodium. Um, the label rate up here, half, quarter, zero, after one hour, after 24 hours. And you can see, firstly, that it's very easy to plate out millet seed. Very nice and easy, easy to count. And the treatment after uh, 24 hours, at even a quarter of the rate of methane sodium, shows that it, is, it kills Phytophthora. So it looks like it's effective. <coughs> But there's no point in taking this. You really have to start working in the field. So this is the field experiments that we did, a large uh, a number of them. The first thing we found out was that millet seed, if you put it uh, into gravel, um, every saprophyte in gravel loves millet seed. And so it just dives in and outcompetes Phytophthora. So we had to use a different sort of inoculum. We used pine plugs, which are shown here, uh, colonized by Phytophthora for probably about six months before they were used. We had to put them into the gravel and be able to take them out again. So whilst we were discussing this with colleagues, somebody suggested using burly cages. They were obviously a keen fisherman and weighted burly cages. So we bought several hundred of these. I think we exhausted the whole of the state's supply at one stage. <laughs> and we had them powder coated because they're galvanized and they've got a lead weight at the bottom. And both zinc and lead are inhibitory to Phytophthora. So we got that done. We attached them to <coughs> stout fishing line. We could have them powder coated any color we wanted. So having two colors meant that we could use two species of Phytophthora without getting them muddled up, we hoped. And then we used them, throwing them into these five cubic meters of gravel during the construction of the gravel stockpiles. The, we were trying to emulate the way that this would work commercially, but we were totally unsuccessful at that. So the um, methane sodium was added using a knapsack sprayer. And when we were constructing these stockpiles, for example, we would have a bobcat layer of gravel. We would spray that with methane sodium. You'd have another bobcat layer of gravel. We'd throw in our pine plug inoculum and you probably can't see it, but round the edge of each of these cones, there is the fishing line with flagging tape on it um, so that we knew which species of phytophthora we were going to be removing, and so on. We did this to make a five cubic meter stockpile of gravel. The um, pine plugs were removed at different times after, in, after the stockpiles had been constructed. And then we would take out the um, pine plugs, clean them up, plate them out onto selective agar. And here, for example, we have a control. So um, zero methane sodium. And here we would have the meth uh, treated with methane sodium after one hour. These two plates would be of Phytophthora cinnamomi. So in this case, at this particular rate, Phytophthora was killed within one hour within the pine plugs. This one is a different species of Phytophthora, Phytophthora multivora, and it's still surviving after one hour in pine plugs. But we left them all a bit longer than that. At the same time, these stockpiles were sampled for MITC, 
to see how long that hung around in the stockpiles because you don't want to open up the stockpiles and find that your operators um, would be affected by fumes of MITC. So this is the general sort of method that we used. We also wanted to approach the, um, the capping of the, the stockpiles. Uh, now, the way this is used commercially is that the um, methamsodium is applied, the soil is compacted, um, and then it's irrigated. But gravel crusts, it has about 5% uh, fines, and it has perhaps about 5% water. And it crusts quite quickly, so that it gets very hard on the surface. And we thought that the crusting would be sufficient to seal the stockpiles. But we needed to check. And so we had colleagues from the Chem Center who set up monitoring devices, or sampling devices, on either side, upwind and downwind, of the stockpile. And the MITC from the uh, treated gravel was measured. And it was only detected five meters downwind within 24 hours of treatment. So we thought that crusting was actually effective. So this took quite a number of years. And an application was made to the APVMA in 2012 for a label change. We set on a, a rate of 80 mils per cubic meter, which is about half the label rate for horticulture. We had a withholding period of 28 days because by that time MITC could no longer be detected in the gravel. The gravel stockpiles needed were unsealed because gravel crusts and an exclusion zone um, of at least five meters. And this work was done by uh, the colleagues, Sasha Kazami and Nigel West from the Chem Center Susie MacDonald and Ben Wharton from the Water Quality uh, Centre uh, at Curtin, Scott Payton from New Farm, and Francis Tay, who's in the audience here, who's worked with me for many years. And we had funding and support for this from B&J Catalanos, Main Roads, Merua, it's so long ago that's actually changed its name, New Farm, DAFWA, which has also changed its name, and DEC. The label change came through in 2017. Well, that's quite a long time to wait. Um, and they accepted all of the things that we had suggested apart from the exclusion zone, which they suggested, they said, should be 200 meters. But it doesn't really matter because it meant that scaling up was now possible. So we can go into the second phase of this work which I haven't had much to do with. It's been really um, done by main roads um, and funded by main roads. And the first of these was a large inoculation experiment using 1,500 cubic meters of gravel, which makes our five cubic meter stockpiles look a bit silly. It was done by Arbor Carbon, um, and it was conducted at Colford Quarry, which is in North Bannister. Methane sodium was applied at a nominal rate of 80 mils per cubic meter. We used a pine plug inoculum, and instead of just putting it into burly cages and throwing them into these stockpiles here, you, they were placed in these plastic tubes, which were slotted at this end that goes into the stockpile to allow MITC to get in there. And then they were sealed on the outer uh, part of the tube. And the tubes were positioned at different heights and different depths into the stockpile. The stockpiles were unsealed. There was a withholding period of four weeks. And there was an exclusion zone of 200 <coughs> meters as specified by the APVMA. And MITC was monitored to 100 meters downwind on two, three, four, five, and eight days after treatment. Now, after 28 days, all the tubes were taken out and the pine plugs were retrieved and 
they were they were all plated out at uh, DBCA and some of the people involved in that are here in the audience so they have sympathies with all of us who plated out these things and the plating out showed that there was less than 6% survival of Phytophthora in the pine plugs. Now, it depends on which way you look at this. Oh, we killed 94% of it. Or, oh, it didn't, we didn't kill everything, which was what we were expecting. There was almost 6% that survived. But any experiment that doesn't work particularly well, or quite as you think, is always very instructive. So there were lots of lessons learned from this original, this um, large inoculation trial. Phytophthora survived in the areas here shown in red. The outer face and bottom edge of the stockpile. And if you look at the stockpile here, you can see that the gravel is much coarser here than further up the stockpile. So there's <coughs> segregation of the gravel. In the areas of poor crust formation, there'll be loss of MITC. So it won't be sealing as well. The air quality monitoring also showed that MITC was detected 100 meters from the stockpile on one occasion. So I think the APVMA were right to be very cautious. But it meant you had to go back and look at every stage of the operation to see whether you could improve the sealing of the stockpiles um, to uh, a better stockpile construction to minimize segregation. And this is a well-known problem in the uh, gravel industry. And there are ways to, uh, to resolve this. They're looking at better ways of sealing the stockpiles and the, um, the application of MIT uh, of methamsodium sodium was not as good as it should have been. It wasn't as easy as it should have been and so a better application method was needed. So that was the outcome of the Arbor Carbon work or at least a very uh, brief summary of it. And so the process was redesigned and this was done by the people at Culford, the Culford Quarry. And so we ha don't have a number of cones here. We have concentric, uh, we have a number of um, ribs. And there is, I will show you in a minute, uh, a sacker uh, producing these. This is a 30,000 cubic meter stockpile. And it's also sprouted a bund around the bottom to contain it. This is the truck that has been redesigned with the redesigned application method for methamsodium. There's a drum of methamsodium on the back here. Here's a hose coming off there. There's a truck way off in the distance, which would be this truck. This is the other end of the operation. Here is the conveyor. There's gravel coming up here. The methane sodium is applied under this cowl here and it's falling onto one of these um, uh, 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 ribs of the stockpile. So this is the methane sodium hose and the method of application is now much more controlled than it was in the uh, large inoculation experiment. They also using a water cannon to water the stockpile at the end of each day. And they're applying 10 millimeters of water um, again from this truck. So they're de de definitely sealing the stockpile. Um, so this is a, a number of improvements which have just gone from looking at the original process in the uh, experiment done by Arbor Carbon to improve the efficacy and the um, ability of methane sodium to be delivered more easily and more reliably 
and also to minimize the um, sorting of gravel and to improve the uh, sealing of the stockpiles. And it's been accepted by main roads as being perfectly acceptable modifications. But there's one thing that needs to be done as well, which is verification. Because how can you tell that the gravel's been treated? Because after all, treated and untreated gravel look exactly the same. You can use the paperwork, but I'm a great cynic, and I can realize that this could be manipulated if you wanted to. You could sample gravel for phytophthora, but it would be logistically difficult. How do you sample a 30,000 cubic meter stockpile and feel that you're doing this um, in a, uh, a, a feeling confident with the results? And it would also be exceedingly expensive because of the cost of, of all those samples. You could look for residues of methane sodium, but there aren't any. They're all gaseous, so they've all, they've all disappeared. And so we thought it might be possible to use an indirect method because methane sodium doesn't just kill phytophthora. It affects all the microorganisms in, in gravel. Um, so are there changes to the microbial diversity of the gravel that could be used to indicate that the gravel has actually been treated? So it was very much a suck it and see exercise because main roads didn't have any money to actually put into devising a test that could be used. But the company Bioscience, which is a small West Australian company, has a, a, a method for looking at um, the microbial diversity of soil, horticultural soil or agricultural soil. It's an automated ribosomal intergeneric space for analysis or a RISA assay. And it uses primer pairs to look at the diversity of nine groups of microorganisms. And using some bags of untreated gravel and treated gravel, which hadn't really been kept in any particular uh, way, um, they were just lying around. We happened to have them as the way you do. We found that um, in the untreated gravel, there's one group of microorganisms which bioscience called bacteria one, and that's about as far as my microbiology goes. And there are more of those, more OTUs of those in the untreated gravel than in the treated gravel. You can see here. Otherwise, there's no, really no difference with the other groups of microorganisms. But if you use a principal components ordination, it shows that bacteria one in treated and untreated gravel cluster very differently. So the green ones are the treated gravel. The brown ones are the untreated gravel. And so you could use both the number of OTUs that you get from this analysis and also their clustering to show that there is a difference between the treated and untreated gravel. It doesn't mean to say that's a result of the treatment with methane sodium, but there is a difference. And that's really probably as much as you need, much as you can expect. This effect we now know is apparent within six weeks of treatment, and it persists for more than 15 weeks. So let's just summarize all of this and die back free gravel. We've shown that methane sodium treatment can be used to produce large volumes of dieback free gravel. The treatment is applied at the end of the extraction operation. And this is really important because it means that there's less chance of the treated gravel being subsequently contaminated. The cost is $20 per cubic meter at the quarry gate. But when you think about gravel, a large proportion of the cost delivered on site is transport costs. And this means that you could actually go and treat an infested area, an infested gravel pit, 
close to where the gravel is needed and therefore reduce the transport costs. The equipment which is being used to doing all of this is mobile and so it can be moved to where it's needed. We have the verification process. We've got the paper trail which is being produced and we also have the ERISA assay. Now we know the ERISA assay shows differences at the Culford Quarry. I don't know whether it would show differences for another <coughs> gravel uh, pit. So I don't know whether that um, difference is a portable one. In, whilst all this was happening, Culford Quarry has obtained ISO accreditation for the whole process. And because the APVMA label change is Australia-wide, this is available for the whole of Australia. So, lastly, thanks to Main Roads for pushing all of this and providing funding. To Arbor Carbon for doing that scaled up inoculation trial, which was so instructive. To Culford Quarry for allowing the work to be done on their site and thinking through the whole process and redesigning the whole process. To Bioscience, who happened to have an ERISA assay that just seemed to fit the bill for what we needed. And to BDCA, who um, have supported this all the way through. And I'd like to say it's been a great pleasure to work with all of these people because they've been so enthusiastic about the whole process. Thank you very much. Has it been adapted to other applications as well, such as, let's say, for example, if there is a um, horticultural field that's infested with a uh, phytophthora, and that, in other words, you can't really plant anything there without it you know, dying? Has it been used to sort of treat and have the soil in, in, in farms and things like that? Um, you know? the, um, well, yes, it, methan sodium would be used to treat um, soil borne pests and pathogens in. A horticultural situation and of course it's already registered for that so um, I think that's really about the starting point where we came in so um, there's no reason to think that it's any different from the current usage of methane sodium Yes. Um, was there any increase of like the um, chemicals leaking when you use that method compared to like inoculating the pile? Um, well, you knew the rate at which you you had a, a nominal rate that you wanted to apply it at. Um, Kim is from yeah, Colford. Oh, hello, Kim. There you go. And <laughs> um, he he knows exactly what's going on under that cow at the end of the stacker. Um, and it's not important that you have a fine spray or anything like that. You could just dribble the methan sodium onto the gravel because it's the MITC which does the work, and that's going to um, diffuse through the gravel stockpile. So um, you really want to have the coarsest um, drops possible so that the nozzles don't get clogged up with the fines from the gravel. Is that, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Tim. You, you've taught me well. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm not sure about what is already done by the nursery industry. If they're trying to, um, if they're trying to. Um, sterilize or treat large piles, large volumes of uh, potting soil, um, whether they already use methane sodium in this context, um, in this way. 
because I think there are options using a solid form which whose name I don't remember um, and this will treat that volume of soil so I think there's there's that's perhaps already been explored but this is really treating very large volumes rather than just very small volumes. Yes, Dominic. I think that the MITC is going to be um, effective against all of those organisms. It, I don't think you're looking at something which is selective. It's, it's a, I'd like to call it broad acre um, <laughs> um, biocide. Yes, because after all, it's used to control not just soil-borne uh, pathogens, but also pests and also weeds. So it's got a very wide range of target organisms. So following on from that then, because we do know that it has such a broad range yes. of chemicals, and with the illicit test, we show that there's a difference in our microbial community. Yes. How much of that is good stuff that, that we really need? Yes. Yes, of course. In those days, and the farmers thought it was the best thing out, but what they didn't realise was it actually killed all the good bugs in the soil, as well as the bad bugs. And then, so if, if a bad bug got in, it would go to right throughout. I'm pretty very sensitive. Yes, but, I understand. Um, but I assume methane sodium is going to be doing exactly the same thing. Can we turn off our good communities that we don't want? Well, methane sodium. Um, Yes, it will certainly be um, affecting both beneficial saprophytes in the gravel. But firstly, the, this is a one-off treatment for gravel. That's the first thing to say. So you don't have to worry about any enhanced microbial breakdown of the um, methane sodium by other microorganisms in soil as you have in... Um, soil which is regularly treated with methane sodium and that is a, a major problem for horticulturalists because they may find that if they're using methane sodium or other agricultural chemicals which get onto the soil then <coughs> microorganisms in the soil can use those as food source and start to break them down so you have a problem where these those chemicals are no longer effective um, you don't have to worry about that with gravel it's a one-off so I've forgotten all about that. <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean to say you shouldn't be wary about these things if you're trying to use this as a way of treating other uh, soil type products. And I think you need to look at each of those and weigh up the advantages and disadvantages of using this type of treatment. Yes, I'm sorry, Roger. Has there been any work done on the proper expressions of using other materials, um, water soluble like waxes or, or carbonates like money grips before reliable with water gap? This is, this is, is it, to, sorry. Um, is there any work plan to identify how significant the risk is of that for the main 6%? Well, the suggestion has been made a number of times that the, the large inoculation trial that was done by Arbor Carbon should be repeated to just to confirm that you can have a 100% kill of Phytophthora. And I think this has some merit, but you need a very large checkbook. And so far, nobody has come up with a very large checkbook. <laughs> if, you, if you think, you know, you've got a few spare millions, I think, to do this, then yes, I'm sure it could be done.
but um, so far, no, I think that the way in which the risks have been considered and, and have been managed is probably considered to be adequate. Um, the other thing to mention is that large pieces of pine stem that like this colonized by Phytophthora. If any gravel supplier had those in their gravel that they were supplying, they would probably be out of business very quickly because you would remove any large bits of organic matter as part and parcel of the gravel um, process. Have I said the right things, Kim? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The um, talk that you've just given was what I might call an industrial scale. And could you tell us any about any sort of um, work that you did preceding that industrial scale? Um, uh, I'll tell you later, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I thought. <laughs> if, if people go to, the, for example, the Alcoa mine sites, they always love to see the big machinery. And that, I thought, might be of interest to people who usually work in a laboratory, you know, with fine forceps and fiddling around with very small things. So I think having a water cannon as part of your equipment for sealing gravel stockpiles is something I would love to have a go at. <laughs> so, um, so it was a really fantastic uh, story this afternoon. I, I can't help but reflect on the days back in 1997 on the Carrot page where I met this fantastically inspiring person, uh, driven, focused, and absolutely dedicated to her work. And, when I see the acknowledgements at the end of the presentation there, I think that I'd like to perhaps on behalf of those people to reflect back the acknowledgement of everything that Elaine has contributed right throughout that project. It's now 10, 15, or 20 years in the to get to the point where we are today. So on their behalf, you know, I think it's absolutely kudos to the approval of this fantastic focus and dedication. So on behalf of the APPS, we actually have a I think maybe a little bit later um, to do some photos with the APPS deck and others together. But um, it was incredible to be here. This incredible bunch of flowers. And this is this is recognition from the APPS for you. You can feel like some cool over here. It's like your eyes are going to be arms day today. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's absolutely lovely. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much, Mark, for that kind, those kind words. And thanks to the APPS for um, contributing, and also to um, the audience here. I thought we might have an audience of one or two, but I was <laughs> absolutely blown away when I saw so many people. And next time we'll take the Albert Hall. <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Bob Hagen. Oh. Um, look, it's a great pleasure to be able to stand up here today and reflect on, um, well, D DBCA, CAR, um, and involvement with Elaine on this project. Um, I first became involved with um, the whole process of the methane sodium and the gravel story back when I was manager of um, what was called Forest Policy and Practice Grant in Harvard. And we were responsible at that time of reviewing a lot of the management documents which guided various uses in the forest so we would have standards for clearing and re-establishing and rehabilitating gravel pits and standards for you know water management and those sorts of things. And I went to a dieback conference, a dig conference out at um, Murdoch probably 2009 or 10 or late, probably, before you, uh, while, while she was still struggling to get um, some of that work done with Catalanos and you know the process through the APMA. And, um, when I first um, heard the, um, the, the idea that, that Elaine had, it struck me as being one of the most valuable conservation tools that, that we have available. 
we, we needed it because the idea that we were continuing to clear uninfested Jarra forest or uninfested forest of basically any type, any type that we could interpret to produce um, dioxide free gravel um, was, was, real, was really problematic and, and part of the reason why Elaine quite rightly said it's in short supply because you know, as um, mechanisation in the forest has, has improved or, or has expanded as people continue to use motorbikes and you know, four wheel drives and use all the roads and, and be out and about in the bush, the likelihood of spread of Lytophthora through inadvertent means as well as through you know, industrial uh, you know, timber harvesting, mining, you know, whatever else you want. Um, it, it's, it's really put the pressure on those uh, remaining areas of uninvested forest. And so the idea that we could move away from clearing those areas to produce a basic raw material, with the idea that we could move to other sources of basic raw material which were currently unavailable to us. So we couldn't really, um, uh, hand on heart, say that if you go to a farmer's paddock, even though there was no signs of PC, you couldn't really say it was dieback free. Whereas uh, and similarly with the old old uh, remnant gravel pits that had been mined you know, many years before, we wanted to be able to have a mechanism which would enable us to do a couple of things. First, that we wanted to be able to recover um, the, re the residual gravel that was left around there because you know, if you could put those days it was bulldozers and front end loaders and stuff. To, so you had to have perfect gravel in situ if you like. So once you got to floating rocks and those sort of things then the ability to use the gravel mixed up with that became more and more difficult till they got to a stage where they say, no, nah, you know, there's still a lot of gravel here, but it's too rocky or it's you know too hard to get to. So there was a there was a large number of these old pits which if we could introduce industrial um, uh, gravel recovery, so crushes and screens and all those things, then we could actually bring a lot of those rocks, all that other um, material that we didn't know its uh, its uh, disease status and start to recover those. And then that gave us the chance to then rehabilitate those sites that are probably free because on one hand the contractor would take raw material or basic raw material and they would then have to rehabilitate the site again. So we could then revegetate and do all, all those things. So the, and the, the, the other point that Elaine made, a very, very um, solid point, was it also meant that you could save a lot of money from the industry because of the capacity to, to use the gravel within you know, a stone's throw of any of these jobs, which was in a farmer's paddock or, or in or in degraded forest that was that was badly PC affected, we could go in there, use what we know was infected gravel, put it through that process, and out the other end came came a product which we were happy to to use. So forest policy and practices branch in that sense was to try and think about how we could incorporate some of these new practices and, and emerging processes into it. So. We looked at things like, you know, ISO accreditation you know, and, and the sort of stuff that, that Culford did. And we would be very happy to say that once someone was accredited in that and they had their ISO accreditation, then we could work with them to do subsequent monitoring or whatever to, to make sure that, um, you know, the process was uh, had been followed through and, and what was being laid out along the road verges was in fact, you know, direct free gravel. And, and the sorts of things I, I thought about at the time, and I've been out of it now for seven or eight, ten years or something but at the time, um, was, was things like just, you know, recording where the gravel from a particular source went, what road, what road sector it was on, and then you could go back later on and if you saw a great big string of dieback infestation, then you'd say, what you took out there, fellow, wasn't, wasn't dieback free gravel. So, you know, there was, there was some simple ways that you could just do a, 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 a review of the success, if you like, in, in, an, in a practical and an industrial sense. So Elaine was um, over the, you know, 2012, got the APVMA label change, that seemed like, it must have been a lot for, earlier than that that I got involved in, but it seemed like forever to, to go through the machinations of just trying to get the label change so you could go and do the trials. And then there was the process with Catalanos and then it moved on to Calvin. And, you know, one of the most pleasing things in my, my career is that, you know, to see Elaine follow that through through you know 20 odd years and to come up with a process which is now you know industrially recognised and you know saleable across Australia and I, and I think it's it's an absolute you know credit to Elaine and one of the most valuable things for nature conservation in this in, you know in this in, at least in this state because.
because of its capacity to make safe clearing of, of forest and to make raw materials available to previously work. So, Elaine, from a departmental perspective, we, we really enjoyed working with you. Um, you know, we're glad to be involved and I'm really glad that it's come to fruition for you. So on behalf of, well, not DVCA now, but on behalf of DVCA, we really would thank you for that, for your work. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Bob. journey um, and uh, Elaine intersected my journey. Uh, I was at the time uh, the Regional Materials Manager for Main Roads West Australia based out in Whitfield. And as Elaine said in her presentation, the government through the head of agencies uh, had a drive to try and mitigate uh, depreciation of assets. So Main Roads put forward some funding uh, for strategic projects each of their regions and um, I knew from my uh, previous days back in Murdoch Uni and uh, through my experience in Main Roads that the issue of dieback and gravel was a, a huge problem and that was continuing and we needed to answer it and answer it uh, uh, convincingly going forward. So I put up uh, an application for funding, uh, not knowing what I was going to do with it at the time but, and I got granted after a mill to start the research into the eradication of dieback for the wheat belt uh, and construction. So where do we start? So we got involved ourselves with numerous people, shires, um, the environmental officer I had at the time, Michelle Lupton, made lots of inquiries and we managed to get on to CPSM Murdoch University, where Giles Harvey had a theory that we could um, potentially eliminate the pathogen out of a recognised disease portion of Narrow Forest by clearing everything and maintaining a fallow uh, status. So they called the fallow trial. I know he set up two plots in the forest in determined diseased areas. We fenced them off and we cleared all the beds. Uh, I didn't rate out all the, the uh, groups, I left them in there because that's what I wanted to check, whether it persisted down a depth within the root map. Uh, I remember Mark Gray saying your project won't work because it's going to sit there and it'll still be there in the school. So I go, Mark, good point. So we uh, monitored over years and Arthur Carbon being our scientific uh, advisor who managed the sampling. Uh, Sampled and sampled at two low, 300 from, from the top 300, and then down to two metres in depth. So, after a number of years, uh, if Giles is correct, the pathogen does get bored, it dies out, uh, but it's not two years. We haven't finished the project because unfortunately I left the main roads, uh, but hopefully one day uh, someone will throw some money so we can answer that question. Him as he has been my heart and crime for almost the eight years that we were doing these projects now. 
There was three tight